morning. <laughs> I'm not a morning person, so it'll take me a minute to, to catch up. So I think every time I come to Shorter um, to be a part of this chapel time, I feel like I get one word, and I'm not going to say the one word over and over for 30 minutes, but I do feel like I get one word. Last time I was here, I don't know if any of you were here last time I was here, but, but the word was repent. And I talked about what does it mean really when we repent. It's a word we hear a lot in church life, but what does it really mean? So today, this morning, I woke up. I, I knew what I wanted to come and share with you this morning, but the Lord just really put a word on my heart. So I just want to give it to you, and we're going to kind of unpack it uh, this morning for a few minutes. And the word is disruptive. So disruptive. I don't know. It's not a word I think of a lot. I think we live in it a lot. I don't know what your week has been like, but have you had some disruptions this week? Some things that you weren't expecting, right? Uh, I think we all have that day-to-day, week-to-week. Um, but what I think we'll see this morning is God actually wants to get in our disruptive. And in fact, He wants to be disruptive, and I think always when I think about, I, I drove up from Clarkston this morning. I live on the east side of Atlanta. Uh, in my work with Mission Georgia, a lot of what we focus on is helping churches serve needs in their community, especially in the lives of people who are vulnerable, who've really dealt with some disruptions, some pretty serious matters like refugees who've had to flee Afghanistan or Ukraine uh, or... Um, Goodness, so many places, Iraq, uh, Burma, so many places, they've dealt with disruptive things in a, in a pretty extreme way. And then children in foster care. Uh, some of you may have, have had an experience like that, where your life was disrupted in a, in a really significant way. Uh, it might be a, a young woman who is finding out that she's pregnant, and all of a sudden she's dealing with something that's totally disruptive and unexpected, and she doesn't know what to do. And uh, in my work with Mission Georgia, we're just saying to people who love Jesus, hey, listen, God calls us to care for people when they're in the middle of something very disruptive. And so that's what I want to talk with you about this morning for just a few minutes. Now, as we think about this word disruptive, um, I, I guess I just want to call to memory, I don't know if you remember this, the it's probably one of the most famous stories uh, that Jesus told. If you remember, Jesus would tell stories, and they're called parables, and he would tell these stories to teach an important truth. And usually when Jesus told a story, he was pulling from something that at that time people understood. It was very common in that time. Sometimes we read parables today, and they just they don't make sense to us because our times are a little different. But the truth that Jesus was speaking was very important. And that's the case when I think of the most famous story that Jesus told. I think, I don't know, maybe if you remember stories that Jesus told parables, what you would say was the most famous one. But I think of the story of the Good Samaritan. Anybody remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Uh, It was a story that Jesus told when somebody asked him, you know, if I'm supposed to love my neighbor, well, who's my neighbor? And the the person who was asking it was being a real smarty pants about it. Um, And so Jesus kind of met him in that moment. Listen, if you want to be all smarty pants with Jesus, he'll meet you in that moment, if you want to do that. Uh, And he did. And he told, really, a story that's still being told today. It's in the Bible. It's very important. But there are many people around the world, they may not know anything at all uh, about the Bible, but many people know this story of the Good Samaritan, and maybe you do too. Um, In fact, uh, I kind of just want to review it just for a sec with you in case uh, maybe you've forgotten it's been a while since you've thought about the story of the Good Samaritan. But the story of the Good Samaritan, in case you want to look it up, is in Luke 10. So Jesus tells this story in Luke chapter 10. And the story is very simple. A man was in Jerusalem, and he went to Jericho. Anybody remember the significance of Jericho from the Old Testament? It's fascinating that Jesus tells a story, and he brings Jericho back. So in this story, a man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And do you remember what happened to him along the way? He was beaten and robbed, 
and they left him along the side of the road, you know, to die, to whatever. They left him. And so this man is laying along the side of the road, and Jesus goes on and he tells a story that two men came along. One man, the first man, was a priest, and the priest saw him, and Jesus made sure we understand this when he tells this story. He said the priest saw the man but kept going. A second man comes. This man was a Levite. The Levite, Jesus points out, saw the man and kept going. A third man comes along, and this man is a Samaritan, which the Samaritans, to Jesus' audience that he's talking to, is very hated. Like, think of the, the person or the people that you hate the most, and then amplify that a lot. And that was the Samaritan in the eyes of the people that Jesus was speaking to. They hated the Samaritans. But Jesus in his story says this Samaritan comes along and he sees the man who is wounded and hurting on the side of the road. And this man's reaction is different. Jesus says this man sees the hurting person and this man has compassion on him. He has compassion. So much so that the man actually stops, which would have endangered him. He stops, and the Bible says that he picks him up, he uh, attends to his wounds, and he puts him on his mule, his donkey, and he carries him to an inn and an innkeeper. And when he gets to the inn, in our terms today, you can think of it in terms of like, y'all know like a bed and breakfast? That's kind of, when it says an inn and an innkeeper, that's kind of what it would be like, I guess, in our modern terms. It would be like an inn and an innkeeper, a uh, bed and breakfast. So in the story, Jesus says that this good Samaritan, who we call the good Samaritan, takes his man to an inn, and he tells the innkeeper, uh, take care of him. And when I come back, I'm going to pay you for whatever it costs you to care for this man. And Jesus ends the story, and then he asks the smarty pants crowd, okay, you guys, you're so smart. Who's the neighbor in this story? Well, it's really funny because Jesus was making them say <laughs> that the person who was good in the story was actually the person they hate the most. And they said, well, it was, it was the man who helped. They wouldn't even say Samaritan. And so Jesus gives us this story. Now, I want to look back at this story at something, I don't know about you, but um, I'm very thankful that I, I grew up in a home where my parents taught me the Bible, and I've known, I've known this my whole life. And let me just say to, uh, to a good-looking group this morning, I hope that one day when you have a home, and you have a family, and you're a father or you're a mother, I hope one day you'll teach your kids the stories of the Bible. I just want to give that to you this morning. So my parents taught me the story of the Good Samaritan. I've known it since I was a little kid. I've heard lots of sermons on it. But about 10 years ago, I was sitting in a church, actually way far away from here, Reno, Nevada. That's a long way from here. Anybody from Reno, Nevada? Anybody? No. I kind of had a feeling, no. Uh, Reno, Nevada is a long way away. I was sitting in a church in Reno, Nevada, and the pastor was preaching a sermon on the Good Samaritan. And he was going through this story, and for the first time, I asked myself the question, it was like the Lord, I don't know if you ever have this experience, where it feels like the Lord kind of elbows you. Now, not literally, I really hope that doesn't happen, but um, I kind of felt like the Lord was nudging me, and he just asked me this question, Lorna, who, who does the inn and the innkeeper represent in the story? Now, I'm honestly, I'm just sitting there kind of dazed out listening to the sermon. I mean, I've heard this sermon before. I'm just confessing to you, okay? So I've heard this before, and I'm kind of like dazed out. And I think the Lord caught me and was like, hey, 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 yo, uh, have you ever thought about who the inn and the innkeeper represent? And honestly, I never thought about it. I mean, I just honestly have never thought about it. 
So I was sitting there and I was thinking, okay, let's just review this. So I don't know if you know this, if you've, if you've ever thought through this, but each person in the story of the Good Samaritan represents someone. So uh, the story of the man who leaves his home um, and then is, uh, is hurt really represents somebody who's just living their life. There's just a normal person. And then something in life happens, and there's devastation. There, there is pain. There is destruction. There, life-threatening. I mean, whatever it is. So this, this guy who was leaving his home, he was just living a normal life, and then everything changed in a moment. And um, so it can represent just people, just everyday people dealing with hard stuff in life, right? And, um, and then the three men who came along, uh, the priest represents religious people. You know, people who think, we're good. I'm a good person. I'm religious. I go to church. I go to chapel on Wednesday morning at Shorter. You know, I'm, you might say, I'm a religious person. And, and then the, the Levite. The Levite was very respected, very smart. You know, you wouldn't take the time of a Levite. Very important. So somebody who's busy, got plans, you're doing things, you're going places in life. And then, uh, of course, the... The Good Samaritan, the Samaritan. And if, if you know, if you've heard any sermons, you know that the Samaritan in the story represents Jesus. He's the Savior. He comes in and he scoops, he scoops up hurting and broken people and he redeems and he heals and he restores. And amen, I hope you've experienced that. Listen, if you're sitting here this morning and you're dealing with some brokenness and hurt in your life, I want you to hear right here that Jesus in Luke 10, as he's telling this story, he's giving you a picture of what he does. You may say, Lorna, I was just living my life, doing my thing, thought everything was okay, and then wham, something disrupted my life, and now I'm laying on the side of the road. I don't know what to do. Jesus is for you this morning. I don't want you to miss that. But then the inn and the innkeeper, I had never considered who does the inn and the innkeeper represent. I had never thought about this before. But then here's my take on it. I don't know if it'll reach shorter university standards. Um, but here's what I think that the inn and the innkeeper represent. I think that the inn and the innkeeper represent someone who follows Jesus, the innkeeper, and the inn represents the body of Christ, the church or churches. And as I have been thinking through the years about this, I love it. I'll just say real quick. I love it. At the end of the story, Jesus tells the innkeeper, he says, hey, uh, you take care of hurting people until I come back. Does that sound a little familiar about some things that we know about Jesus? Take care of hurting people until I come back. And he even says, he gives another little nod, Jesus will come back, by the way, that's what I'm saying. Jesus is returning, he will come back. Um, he even gives another little nod, he says, and when I come back, I'm gonna come with, another way we could say it is, I am coming back with a reward. Now, there's one group of people that the Bible says Jesus is coming back for. And that's the body of Christ, those who follow him. And so I believe that this is the end of the end keeper, is Jesus giving a little wink, a little nod, a little what's up to the church, the body of Christ. And so I believe that this is instructive for you and I about how we are to live. If you're following Jesus, our lives are to be about what the inn and the innkeeper is doing. And I, I don't have time to really unpack all that. I just want to toss that out to you and let you look into that. But here's the thing that I want us to look back at specifically about disruptive. I don't know if you remember, you probably do. This is not the first time we encounter an inn and an innkeeper in the New Testament, is it? It's not the first time. In Luke 10, you remember the first time that we encounter and in and an innkeeper, in, especially in, in the Gospel of Luke, is actually back in Luke 2. The Christmas story, right? I bet everybody remembers that. I mean, I felt like as a kid, we were supposed to not like the inn and the innkeeper, right? 
You know, like there's always a good and a bad in a story. And I felt like in the Christmas story, Jesus being born, the Savior of the world, I mean, it's, it's the greatest story. Truly, Jesus is the greatest story ever told, and it's true. And Jesus came, and ooh, there was a bad, mean jerk of an innkeeper. And he told, remember, Mary and Joseph went to Bethlehem, and while they were there on the way, and when they got there, they had to have a place to stay, and Mary starts going into labor, and they need a place to stay, and they're knocking on all the doors, and they're trying to find a place to stay, and they get to the, maybe the last one, and they knock on the door, and the innkeeper says, I'm sorry, there's no room in the inn. Dun, dun, dun. I mean, it's like the plot thickens. I feel like we're watching a movie, right? The plot thickens. There's no room in the inn. And of course, this has been depicted in movies and television shows and all this. We all give our best stab at what was that moment like? Because that's like real life. You're about to give birth and you don't have a place to stay. That's real life. And of course, you remember that uh, maybe the innkeeper felt bad and he said, well, I got a place out back. It's where the animals are. Uh, But um, you can stay there. And so we know, (laughs) as God does with disruptions, that actually all of that was a part of God's story that he had prophesied thousands of years before. This, you see, the innkeeper was actually a part of a bigger story. But as kids, I don't know about you, when you heard about the innkeeper, I just thought the innkeeper was a jerk and, and all that kind of stuff. So they stay back there, and of course we know the rest of the story. I hope you know the rest of the story, and it is a true story. And I hope you'll read in Luke 2. Christmas will be here soon. Christmas break. So here's the thing. I had never considered the fact that it's so cool of Jesus that in Luke 10, he makes a hero of the jerk from Luke 2. Never considered that. That the jerk, the innkeeper in Luke 2, who said there's no room in the inn, which is a true story that impacted Jesus' life, This is the same Jesus who's now a a grown adult man and he's looking into a group of people's faces and he's telling a story and he could have made anyone the hero in the story and he chose to make the innkeeper the hero in the story. The type of person who had rejected him in Luke chapter 2 is now the innkeeper who takes in the hurting and broken man. And I just got to tell you this. I love this about Jesus. I love this, that this is just, it's it's kind of like hidden right before our eyes in Luke chapter 10, that, that Jesus transforms the story. Jesus changes the narrative of all the innkeepers. I mean, talk about a bad profession, you know, if uh, through the years, if, if you're in that region and, and uh, you know, hey, what do you do? I'm an innkeeper. Uh, was your granddaddy an innkeeper in Bethlehem? I mean, you know, it's kind of like the, the hang the head of shame. I'm an innkeeper. But Jesus chooses to redeem this storyline and he disrupts that narrative and he changes it. And I want to tell you this morning The thing that to me that Jesus is saying as he tells this story, there's so many things in the story of the Good Samaritan, so many, and I don't even have time to go through them all. But the one thing that I want you to hear this morning is that Jesus is the Savior of second million chances. And yes, I do know I just made up a word. Not just second chances. I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase. I've heard it a lot. Jesus is the Savior of second chances, and he is. But I'm telling you, he will give you a million second chances. And I love that in this story that Jesus didn't have to change the storyline, the narrative of of inns and innkeepers, but he did. He chose to change the storyline. God is disruptive in a good way. But all right, now putting those two together, I want you to see something though. There's two very important things. You can miss God's activity. So you and your life and the way you live your life, me, the way I live my life, I can actually be 
disruptive of God's activity in my own life. Now, here, here's the thing. God is always at work glorifying his name across the whole earth, every language, every time zone, every difficulty, every tragedy. I hope you know and you're secure in the reality that God is always glorifying his name, even on the darkest night. There's no coincidence no coincidence that the Savior of the world was born at night. In the, dark, in the darkness of the night, our hope came. So don't you ever doubt, and I can stand here with so much assurance, I'd be scared to death of looking into a room full of athletes and students and smart people. and, and you know, I'd be scared. To, I'd be so intimidated right now. I don't know if you've ever had a chance to do this, but you would be too. You'd be scared to death and intimidated to do this unless I were not sure of the fact that Jesus is always at work glorifying his name, and I want you to know it. That's what gives me all my confidence that compels me to drive up here and spend time with you is I want you to know that God is always at work no matter what is happening, but you can miss the activity of God just like the innkeeper in the first story. In Luke chapter 2, what was happening in the innkeeper's life and in his end was actually disruptive. It prevented him from being a part of that story in a different way. And I had never been challenged by that before. I don't like that. So you know what? It makes me think, God, okay, I don't want to be like the innkeeper in Luke 2. I don't want to tell you there's no room in my life. I want you to know there is place in my life for you. And listen, I remember what it's like to be a college student. I remember the papers and going to the library and talking to everybody but studying. I mean, I remember how busy it is. But I do remember how it was in my college years, the years that you're in right now, that God began to teach me how I could choose myself to make room for Jesus in my life. And I'm thankful that I have people in my life who help me make those choices and I want to encourage you, and I want to say, not just at chapel, but I know uh, David and so many others here on the, the staff, they're here to help you see God's disruptions in your life. There's some things happening in your life you'd probably love God to come and disrupt. They're here to help you do that. Listen, if you want to come and just go to school, go to class, get your diploma, and leave, you can do it. There's a lot of people who do it. They've watched them come and go. If you want to do that, that's your choice. But I'm telling you this morning, disruptive. God wants to be disruptive in your life. Not just this morning, but the days and months and years that you're here. God wants to change some things in your life. I know that because God is always changing things in our life. He's always at work and he wants us to see it and he wants us to join that activity. Like the inn and the innkeeper in Luke 10. In Luke 10, the innkeeper, in the story that Jesus told, making him the hero, evidently, Jesus tells the story in such a way that indicates to us that the innkeeper received someone who was broken and hurting and took care of them. And the story ends. Jesus doesn't tell us the rest of the story. And here's why I think, here's why I think Jesus didn't tell the rest of the story. Because you and I finish that story. We live that story. We are the continuing story of the Good Samaritan. It's our choice. Are we going to embrace things that are disruptive in our life? Are we going to be used of God to be a blessing to someone? Because that's, that's ultimately what we see, the story of the Good Samaritan. You know, um, my nephew, I was, I was just uh, talking with someone and telling my nephew, um, plays football for a team that came and played y'all. I'm not going to say any more than that because I, I don't want to stir up bad feelings here. But uh, my nephew uh, came and played in the football game. He's, he's an offensive lineman. So um, I had a hard time in that game. Like, I followed y'all's game. And I, I knew that game was coming. I couldn't come up. I was out of town. Uh, but I was watching that game, and... Um, and I, I, I really was struggling because I, I do love Shorter. I love you guys. I love what happens here. So I, I'm a fan of Shorter. I really am. I never considered that my nephew 
would play on an opposing football team. Like, that's a real quagmire for me. That's a tough one. So I just said, I love y'all both, okay? So, um, but let me tell you something. For, for my nephew, I pray every day, and I'm not kidding you. I pray every day. Now I have two nephews that are in college. I pray every day that there will in his case, that there will be some guys on the football team with him who will help him be a better man. I do. And I pray that for my other nephew who's in another university. I want people in my nephew's life who will help them be who God created them to be. And I pray that when they become that person on the side of the road, they have a terrible exam and they think, you know, they've failed their whole college career. I pray that somebody on campus will step into their life, pick them up and help them know, hey, dude, let's just go get some Taco Bell. Everything will be better. I say that because we love Taco Bell. Don't tell anybody. This is on, oh man, never mind. It's online. So I pray that somebody in their life will pick them up and say, yo, bro, listen, it's bad right now. It's going to be all right. Okay. So here's my challenge to you. Uh, as we think about this thing of, of life that's disruptive, every one of you are living a disruptive life. Me too. And our disruptive life is either good or bad. You're either disruptive in a way to other people where you're helpful and, and you're actually helping and you're blessing and you're encouraging just in your way, or you are a disruption and you're being disruptive in somebody's life in a way that's hurting them and not helping them. And when they look back on their life, they're going to look back and they're going to remember, maybe not your name, but they'll remember your face because I'm the same way. I look back and I remember the people who were disruptive in my life in a good way. And I remember the people in my life who were disruptive in a bad way. And it challenges me to say, Lorna, how am I being disruptive in my life? with what God is giving me to do. And so I want to challenge that with you this morning. Are you Luke 2 or are you Luke 10? Which one are you? In fact, I just want to say in the story of the Good Samaritan, who are you in the story? Because the reality is, let's just put aside the innkeeper. The reality is every one of you today, right now, every one of you, me included, we are all someone in the Good Samaritan story. You might be the person who you're just like, I'm just going to class, Lorna, and uh, I'm going to eat afterwards, and uh, I got practice this afternoon. Like, you're just like the man who's leaving Jerusalem. You're like, I'm just doing my thing. And you don't know that everything in your life is about to change. And I want you to know, when you get to those moments and you realize, I was just minding my own business and things fell apart, Jesus will be there. So you might be the person who actually today, you're at that point in the story, you are the broken person on the side of the road. And I just want to say again, I've, I've been there. As a, as a Jesus follower, I have been the person broken on the side of the road. And I've needed people to come along and be Jesus, to be the Good Samaritan in my life. And so I want to say to you, if you are that person this morning and you've got some real hurt and you're like, you're going to class, but you're kind of barely making it and you're going to practice and you're barely making it, just be honest about it and say, hey, I'm the broken person in the Good Samaritan story and I need God to work in my life. And tell somebody, I'm giving you an excuse today. Just say, you know, whoever that was at chapel this morning, she talked about, you know, the Good Samaritan story. I'm actually the dude laying on the side of the road right now, today. And I need somebody to help me. If that's all you know to say, you have said everything. And God is going to bring people to you who are actually going to be like the Good Samaritan. The Bible says in Colossians that Christ in us, the hope of glory... Jesus, when we follow Jesus, he transforms our lives, and now we live like he did in the story of the Good Samaritan. We 
look for an opportunity to serve others. And, you know, the blessing for me with Mission Georgia is that I get to uh, help and equip and find the people who are doing that. Foster care, human trafficking, who are serving people who are hurt on the side of the road. How can we be a blessing to them? How can we serve them and see them be restored to the life that God created them for? But you know, you may be somebody else in the story. You might be, you might be the priest. You might be the Levite. Too busy, too important, got priorities, got things to focus on. And you see hurting people. You see them in your family and you're like, yo, I ain't got time for that. It may be some friends, it may be some teammates, and I'm just saying to you, you got to think about that. You got to think about, do you want to be the person in the Good Samaritan story who just keeps walking by everybody who's hurting? If you want to do that, you can, but God wants to disrupt that. I believe God wants to be disruptive of that this morning, and he wants you to think about life differently. I pray that at some point, all of you will really take the challenge First of all, to receive Jesus into the home of your life. I love that in the story, a really significant part of the story to me is that Jesus didn't just, um, or the Good Samaritan, he didn't just drop the guy off at the front door of the inn. It actually indicates he went in. He went in and he spoke with the innkeeper and he made a plan. He went in, he got in there and he disrupted that inn and the innkeeper and what he was going to do because he just said, hey, I got a dude who's hurt here and I need you to take care of them. That was disruptive. So when Jesus comes into our life, he's going to disrupt some things. And I'm asking you this morning, will you embrace that? You know, I had plans when I was in college, things I thought I was going to do. Um, and I can honestly say now I am thankful God disrupted my plans, and he gave me his plans. And so I want to ask you this morning, who are you in the Luke 10 story, in the Good Samaritan story, and will you consider making room for Jesus in your life in such a way that then becomes a blessing to people around you? Let's pray. Father, this morning, I thank you uh, just for the joy and privilege of serving, and I thank you for um, all of these students, the faculty and staff and friends who are here. Lord, uh, I just put this word before you, again, disruptive. God, be disruptive in our lives, and I do know in a room like this, I know that there are things going on in these students' lives that, honestly, they need you to disrupt. And so I pray, God, just as you did in the Good Samaritan story, that you will redeem brokenness for your glory. And that, Lord, um, what you do in the lives of these students and staff this year at Shorter will be something they will always look back on and they will see you at work in their lives. God, I just ask of this room that you will not allow them to miss your activity in their lives. God, help them, help me see and be responsive to all that you are doing, even on the darkest night. I pray this and I ask this in the redeeming and powerful name of Jesus. Amen.